Today, we will discuss automated testing, what they are for and how to organize them in order to increase the quality of software project in general, and not only increase, but ensure the quality. In general, the idea is clear to everybody. So there is a huge amount of testing which programmers have to do in order to make sure that the software works, and programmers don't want to do it over and over again. We want to do it only once. Automated testing is an obvious, obvious uh, idea, obvious goal to, to automate what we don't want to do over and over again. We don't want to do manual testing over and over. That's why we write automated tests. In automated tests, we program what the, uh, what the client of our software has to do with our software and to, uh, to listen to the responses and um, check that the responses are as we expect. But the main idea of testing, the main idea of automated testing is not just to, uh, to reduce the amount of work uh, a programmer does, but to help programmer to develop the software faster. It's not only to help us to reduce the testing time, but also to reduce us the development time. And many of us don't understand that, so let me explain how I feel about it. So I think that tests in general, automated tests, they are like, uh, I would compare them with a safety net. So when you build something on the on a building, when you build a very tall building, people usually use this uh, equipment which they call safety nets. So they, they put this safety net around their area where they use the instruments and where the, they may make some mistake. And if they make that mistake, then the, the something which they may drop there, or maybe they can fall because of, the, some, uh, because of some mistakes, then the net will catch them. So the net will help them to, to guarantee that there will be no damage, there will be no harm done to any people around and to them as well. And it's hard to imagine for a construction worker to work with the, with the, on the building without a safety net. That would be just impossible. And it's not only about the security of them, it's about the, 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 speed, of develop, the speed of work they do. So if you don't have the safety net, you still, you still can do the same. You still can, uh, can work, uh, you know, can, uh, uh, can build a building. <laughs> but it will take longer. It will take long, much more time because you will be extremely careful about everything you do. You will really pay attention to every single step you make, every single move you make. Exactly the same happens with the software. So, of course, we can't develop everything without unit tests. Of course, we can have no automation tests. We can just write uh, what we want to write fast or, you know, the speed we, we, we have. But this will only work for a very small piece of software. When the software becomes larger, then every next step, every next move will take longer and longer because we will be extremely scared about how much we can break the software which we built before. In order to reduce this fear, as they say, this fear-driven development, some people call it that, uh, when people are uh, scared about breaking the production, about you know, breaking the existing uh, application, about disappointing customers, so they say that uh, the fear which we have because of that actually is driving us forward. So we do everything because we have some fear. So we're scared about breaking stuff, and that's why we... Uh, that's, that's, what, that's the main motivator, the main driving factor for, for us programmers. And it shouldn't be that way. So automated tests, they should reduce this amount of fear. The more automated tests we have, the more you know, advanced they are, the, the stronger they are, the less we care, the less we worry about how much damage we can cause to the previous software. And the less we care about this damage, the faster we develop forward. And of course, you know, it doesn't mean that we will be careless programmers, that we don't care about the functionality we introduce. But to some extent, we will be, we can call that we will be careless. We, we, can, we can say that we're going to be uh, more, you know, more free in, in making changes. And that's good. So when I meet a, a software project, and, and, I, and I meet this, these projects a lot, and I meet those situations a lot where people are, uh, they have the... Uh, they have the product, the product is like 20,000 lines of code already, they develop it for a year, and then when you ask, do you have automated tests, the answers are like, we don't have them, we have just a number of integration tests, like large tests, where the entire piece of software, they just get started, and we check that the result is, is there, so that's it. 
in the best case. In the worst case, they have nothing. They have just a huge amount of software. The software is already deployed to production. Already they have customers. But automated tests, small tests, which we're going to discuss now, union tests, they just don't have them. And the explanation is every time different, but the, the, bottom line is always, the bottom line is always the same. We didn't have time. We didn't have time. We didn't have resources. We didn't have the, the requirement for, from our customer to develop the unit tests. So we only had the requirement to develop the software, not unit tests. And this makes, this argument doesn't sound reasonable because it, it, it would sound like you're building a house, and I just approach you and ask, like, why don't you use the safety net? You're this, you know, 25th floor. And you say, yeah, I didn't have time to, to buy this equipment. I didn't have time to, to, to buy a helmet. I didn't have time to buy the, the protection equipment. I just build a house. So as soon as my customer will tell me that I need the safety net, of course, I will buy it. And, and, and I will, of course, spend time and money on building that. But that's just, that's just weird, because for the construction worker, if you tell them this, they're going to laugh at you. Uh, for programmers, this is uh, this uh, seems to be a, a good uh, a good uh, explanation of why they don't have, have unit tests. And for those, I mean, th those people, let's not discuss them. If they completely don't have unit tests, they have not auto they they don't have automated tests. Then it's one category of programmers. We're not interested in them. I hope you are not one of them. But there is another category of mistakes which people make. Is the mistake when they make like I said, one huge or a number of big, huge integration tests and zero unit tests, or maybe very small number of unit tests. What's the difference between unit testing and integration testing? That's a, that's a, that's a big question which many people ask, and there is no explicit answer, but we can, let's not make it black and white, let's not break the, you know, make a strict line between these two categories, but let's say that, that all automated tests, they can be put on a scale of how much their unit tests and how much their integration tests. So unit tests are, in general, smaller, and they tend to test smaller pieces of software, which that's why they're unit tests. And integration tests, they are larger, slower, and they test in modules or units in combination, in integration. So they put together a number of units. One unit here and many units there. So both tests must exist. We need to have unit tests, we need to have integration tests. But the purpose, the, the goal uh, is different for these two categories. So unit tests, they are extremely small, they're extremely fast. So people say even that the unit test must be instant, so it's going to be like 20 milliseconds. It shouldn't be two seconds. If your test runs for two seconds, it's not a unit test. It's more like integration test. So a unit test has to be extremely fast. It's just one click of a button, and it immediately returns you the result. True, false, it works or it doesn't work. So that's one, one you know, a quality of, of a unit test. Integration tests, on the other hand, usually they are s longer, slower, and sometimes they may take hours. One hour, two hours. I've seen projects doing integration testing for two hours. I mean, you know projects who may run the integration test for days. So integration tests are for something else. Integration are for overall, on the, on the entire scope of the application, confirming that we didn't break anything which we built before. So it's more like a regression testing. I mean, they're both regression testing. People sometimes say there's regression tests, and unit tests are unit tests. But regression means that we test something which we had before. So regression test is more like a term coming from manual testing. So people who do manual testing, they sometimes do regression testing. Regression means that they, they regressively look at what they, they tested already, and they just do the same steps uh, which they've done before, and they, and they, re and they redo uh, the, the same test procedures as they did before. So when the manual testers, when they're looking for bugs, and that's what these testers are doing, so they are either looking for new bugs or they're just trying to run the same scripts as before in order to find the bugs which maybe showed up after the previous round of testing. So let's say yesterday they got a version number one, the manual testers, the people who test manually. So they got the version number one. In this version, they run, I mean, they did maybe 100 operations, 100 clicks of different buttons. So they checked whether I can upload the picture, whether I can download the picture, just different, uh, different clicks of different buttons. So just 100 uh, steps. And then they release the software. And then today, they get a new version. And in this new version, they do regression tests first. Again, the same 100 steps. So they do the same operations, and then they're trying to do extra steps, saying, OK, how about we try to find new bugs? 
Okay, this regression test didn't give us anything, so no, no bugs, nothing. Everything seems to be okay. So now we do extra tests. So these extra tests are like, I don't know, new tests. There's no name for that. But regression is basically doing what was done before. In, in the case of automated tests, I don't think this term can be applied correctly because regression, in, in the case of automation testing, everything is regression testing because we run what we, what we were running before. So, uh, so these integration tests, they are for... Uh, therefore, uh, you know, uh, giving more like a, more or less, let's put it this way, the information which in integration tests give us is not mostly for programming purposes. It's not for really writing the code, but more like making sure that what I did didn't break, you know, overall application. So I would say it's more, uh, it's, it is, these tests are less useful for coders and more useful for architects, for people who decide to release the software, for people to decide what's the status of the application, what's the scope, how much of the scope is done, that kind of information. So unit tests, they're fast and they're used in IDE. So this is my code, this is my test, I just click run, 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 I modified the code, I modified the, the, the live code, and then the test will tell me whether I break or not. So I just change one line here and there, and then I run tests and try and try and try and try. In the end, the code works. That's what unit tests are for. There is no, absolutely no reason to run integration tests in the same manner. So nobody, I mean, it's, if people do that, and people sometimes do that, that's just wrong. So people sometimes do it like this. They, they write large application tests because they say, I cannot, sometimes they say, I cannot write unit tests because I do C, C++ programming. In C and C++, it's impossible to do unit testing. That's very often people say that. Because it's C and C++, because it's so complex, I mean, I need to compile everything together, and then everything together, I run, and then I see how it works. So what they do, they just code, code, code for some time, then they compile the entire application, which takes some time, and then they run one, two, three, some number of, of integration tests. They wait for some time, sometimes for, you know, not for a minute, but for 10 minutes, for, for 30 minutes, and then in the end they say, okay, something was wrong. Something I did wrong. So they go back to the application, they fix a little bit, and the full cycle again. When they are the programmers, it may work for a while, but as soon as they deliver that to another programmer, it's just lack of information for other developers how exactly this code is covered by this unit, by these integration tests. Because integration tests, they're not, they're not, uh, they, they're useless in the, uh, um, when we want to point out the failure in the test to the, to the changes we made in the code. With the unit test, it's very easy because one unit test is testing very small piece of code, usually. Like I said, unit test must be small, but small means that they're testing the small piece of code. So I write the code, this is my, code, this is my large application, large big, of, big, big piece of program, and in this, in this program I have, uh, let's say, these five lines, this small algorithm which calculates something. So for these five lines, I have a unit test which tests exactly these five lines. So it's easy for me to, to understand when I break something in the program, I run my 1,000 unit tests, and I see this one, this one, and this one, they fail. I can, e I can immediately jump to the code and know that if this test fails, then exactly this piece of code is the problem. With the integration test, this information is, is impossible to, to fetch from the result because I compile my code, I compile my you know, large program of 20,000 lines, then I run integration tests, and they say, now when I send this data to your, to your program, I don't receive the, say, the result which I expect to receive. Why does it happen? What is wrong exactly? In which particular place in the program the fault is? It's hard to find. This information is, is not derivable from the tests. From the unit tests, you can't do that. So unit tests just teach you, just tell you, inform you about the, uh, the troubles, about this you know, interconnection between the live code and the and the, and the tests. So no matter what is the language, I believe, no matter what is the language, is it C, C++, or is it Python or JavaScript, you can write unit tests. You must write unit tests. Sometimes people say it's hard. It's hard, it's difficult. It is, it, is, it, may, it may be hard. It's much easier not to do that. It's much easier to, to, to make integration tests because in the integration tests you just you know, run the full, the full application and, and, and then check the output. 
do give the input, check the output. I mean, for I mean, that depends, depends on the software. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, because it depends on the software. If it's, for example, web application, then for web application, uh, integration testing is, I think, harder than unit testing. For common line tools, you know, integration testing is easier, I think, than the unit testing, because common line tools, you can just easily call it, give it the input, and see the output. Uh, so maybe it depends on the type of the application, which, which type of test is easier. But very often I, I hear that for some reason people, the C++ C++ community, they say that uh, uh, we don't do unit testing because it's, because it's pointless to do in our case. Because what exactly are you going to test? That's sometimes I hear this. Like they tell me, like this is, for example, we are writing a software which will, let's say, uh, I had a case some time ago, people were developing a compiler. So they make a compiler for some domain-specific language, not a very complex language, but the compiler. So the compiler is supposed to take the input as a, as a program. So they take a program, and then they, the compiler produces some output in, in form of a binary code, or in their case, it was in form of another program. So you give one language here, and you take another language there. So, and it was written in C++. So it's, it, for them, it was quite easy to write integration tests. You just compile everything together. You get like one package, binary. You put the, as an input, you put some piece of program, and you see what's the output, and you compare the output with what you expect. If something is wrong with the output, you just immediately uh, can tell that, uh, that the, 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 this translator, this uh, compiler, uh, doesn't work as expected. And then they wrote many of those integration tests. So they give this program as an input, another program as an input, another one. So many, many of them, and then you, they check with the output. So they wrote like 100 integration tests, 100 of them, like 100 pairs of input and output, input and output. And they, they, they develop the compiler, and they add more tests to that. They more, they more pairs like that, more input, more output. But zero unit tests. And when I was asking why you don't have unit tests, the answer is like, what exactly are we going to test? So what it's, it's that like a piece which is unbreakable. So our compiler is an unbreakable piece of software. Like, what's the point for us, they say, what's the point of testing uh, inside the compiler this particular function, which does, for example, translation of you know, one token to another token, or translation of uh, you know, a line there to you know, a, a, an array of numbers or something. So what's the point of testing these small elements if we test everything? So they take this compiler as an unbreakable black box, which, according to them, is only possible to test uh, in, in this integration manner, integration testing manner. But I disagree. I don't think it's right. I think it's, uh, it, it may be OK for, uh, for people who develop that, uh, because you know, relatively small amount of time takes to build this compiler, because it's not huge. So, com so, so build together this common line tool, it takes maybe I don't know, maybe half a minute, maybe even 10, 10 seconds. And then to run a single integration test also takes maybe a second or something. So they, for them, it's OK to develop that because they have the entire application in their head, so they know exactly how the application is structured. So imagine they're sitting in front of the computer. They look at the entire application, and they remember where everything is. And now they add some functionality here, and they write an additional integration test. They, r they pass this this everything through this additional integration test, it works, they're happy, they commit the changes. Again, they change something in this black box, again, they run again integration test, it works again or it doesn't work, they change, they know where to fix, they fix it, they commit it all together. So while you increase the functionality, everything is fine. But imagine we step back, imagine we take this product from this team and I jump in, which I don't know how the software is structured. I don't want to have to keep this information in my head. So I open this application, I open this 100 integration test, and now the test number seven doesn't work as expected. So I go to the software, I change something there because I, you know, according to my intuition, so I find the bug, I change this bug, this line I change to that line, I run this integration test, it works. But now three other tests fail. So how do I know where to find the problem now? I mean, I changed here, here, and there, the source code. But now these five tests, they, they break. So I need to find out where exactly I, I, I did something wrong, in which place of the application. But no, no unit tests will tell me that. 
I only know that some integration tests just don't work. So what do I do? I revert back my changes. I go back to the step number zero. Again, I intuitively make some changes. Again, try to run through all integration tests. Again, some number of them fail. Eventually, what will happen? I will just throw away the integration tests those tests who don't let me make my changes because they don't understand them, because I don't know exactly which piece of code I break and, and, and which logic do I break. I just know that I break entire, uh, the entire software. So the bottom line sounds like that. You keep a good balance between these two. So you have both integration tests and, in, and, and both in unit tests and integration tests. That's what I think is reasonable to do. I will show you now a small project in Java where I have both integration tests and unit tests. And you tell me what you think. It's going to be Java. It's a simple library which uh, is capable of taking XML document as an input and then through this doc parse this document and then through this document make some uh, manipulations with this, with this XML. For example, it can find something inside using XPath or it can translate it using XSL or it can validate it using XSD schema, that kind of stuff. So there's a list of files. The library is not huge just about, you know, maybe a dozen files, and there are tests. So usually, usually, that's a good convention, that's a good practice in Java, and I believe in all other languages, is to have one file of a live code with exactly one file for a unit test. This is the rule which many people break for, for some reason, and I, I see it very often. Sometimes. I mean, let me show how it is now here, and then I will explain the error. So let's say, for example, we have a file called strict XML. So for the strict XML, I have strict XML test. I have a file XSL document. For this file, I have XSL document test. I have this, and so on and so forth. So it's one to one, always. But very often I see people in this test folder, and you see in Java there are two folders, and usually in many languages it's the same. There are two folders, uh, except maybe Rust. But in Rust as well, people do. In, in two folders, I don't do, but some people do. I keep, I keep in, in Rust, I keep them together. But uh, in Java, it's two folders. One folder is for sources, one folder is for tests. So people put in the test folder here, they put some extra files, which are, they, they, even, uh, they even create tests which have names not one-to-one -one matching from the, from the live code. For example, uh, let's look at the file strict XML. In the strict XML, I have how many tests? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's nine tests. So some people may say, okay, nine tests is too much. Sometimes there is, look at this, 200 lines, or sometimes I have 1,000 lines in the test file. In the test file, not in the live code. So people break it into pieces. They feel like it's not a good it's just a bad, you know, bad uh, practice to have so many, uh, so many lines in one file. So they break it into a number of files. That's wrong, I believe. That completely breaks the idea of identity of um, uniquely mapping of tests to uh, to production files. They must be mapped. They must be one to one because, like we just discussed, when something breaks, and for example, this test breaks strict XML, whatever, for example, this test, this particular one test breaks, I know exactly in which file is the bug. It's in strict XML because of the name of the test. I don't need to investigate further because in this, inside this class, there could be other documents. For example, look at this, look at this class. So this class involves this, this method, this test method. This test method includes this file, which is mine in this, re in this repository, this file, which is also mine, uh, and then this file, which we're testing. So if I move this, unit, this test method outside of this file and name it somehow else, in three years, I will not understand exactly what are you testing. Are you testing this? Are you testing this testing? Or are you testing this? Because, I mean, they may fail. I mean, the, the failure may be here. The, the, the bug may be in this class as well. The bug may be in another class. But here we're testing this one. So it has to be one-to-one, -one, always. No exceptions. 
Sometimes people need to put some extra classes, extra files, which will only be available for the tests. For example, you, it happens. For example, you have, like, look, this is just maybe 10 tests, and let's say in all of them, or in most of them, we need some functionality, which we don't want to copy-paste. We want it to share uh, among those tests. So we want some class or some, maybe some method to be in the, uh, to be in, uh, in share between them. For that, in, for example, JUnit, we have a mechanism for so-called rules or I don't know what's the right way now in JUnit 5, but there are plugins injectable into unit tests. In JUnit 4, it was rules. Now I don't, I'm not sure what's the right name. So you can create a class, a Java class, and then you know, inform the, 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 this, this unit test that you need this resource uh, to, be, uh, to be used you know, inside, the, inside your test. And then you place them somewhere else. So you don't place them in this folder, you, basically, you better place it into, uh, you create a new folder, right, new package, and say it rules, for example, or test rules, something like this, T rules, whatever. You give it a name. And then in these T rules, then you put all the files there. So for me, it must be clear for people who come after you, after two years, it must be absolutely clear that these files are the tests, and that's why they map one to one to my production code. And this stuff is something else. I will, I will just check this. Imagine I come to this project in, in a few years, and I just open that, and I see T rules, and I open these T rules. The files will be there without the test suffix. And I will look at the production code and see, okay, T rules package is absent here. So I understand that this is something, something completely, you know, unrelated to the production code, to the live code. Make sense? So don't make this mistake. I mean, this mistake people make always. I've never seen a project where people don't make this mistake, unfortunately. They just randomly create test files. They randomly do it. They don't think about the structuring their tests. It's just, just random process. Just, I feel it. Some people call it tests. Some people change names. They make different names. They sometimes lose this prefix. So it's usually, uh, very often, it's a mess. Don't do it. Do it like this. One file to one file. So all of these are unit, are, are unit tests. And um, uh, in Maven, for example, in Java, in Maven world, there is a clear separation between unit tests and the integration test by the, by the suffix of the file. If it's, if it's test, then it's a unit test. If it's IT case, then it's integration test. And in Maven lifecycle, there is even the clear separation in the POM XML between unit tests and integration tests. And even the plugin is different. So there are different plugins who, uh, which uh, different plugins which are responsible for uh, for these two uh, phases of testing, uh, and just in unit testing and integration testing. Uh, so let's take a look at the at the speed of this testing. I don't know. Let's open. You can run all of them, for example. So now we're going to run. Hold on. Now it will take some time to build that. So now we'll see all tests together. I mean, I, I, I built this project long time ago, so that's why it's doing it from scratch. So in Maven, it works like that. And, and, and this is actually, I believe, is a good organization of, uh, uh, of testing strategy. Uh, is making this testing uh, two steps process. Actually, in Maven, it's not two steps. It's, uh, there are more steps than, than two steps. But they do it like this. Uh, first, you run unit tests. I mean, you compile first and everything. Then you run unit tests. And then you do the so-called pre-integration step. And then you do integration tests. And then you do post-integration step. And then you do validation of integration tests. So basically, one, two, three, five steps. On the unit tests, they expect each unit test to be very fast, to complete in just a number of milliseconds, and that's it. Then they call you a pre-integration phase. On this pre-integration phase, you can start 
we'll discuss it later, but you can start additional resources which you need for integration testing. Because integration testing, it is why they're so long, and like we discussed, why they're so slow, because they use many, uh, they, they, they test many, many software modules together, and uh, very often those modules are external modules, not the modules which you created. For example, you might want to use uh, a database, an external database, maybe some external HTTP service, like web service, or you may need some external, I don't know, queue, like web service, which maintains the queue of, of, of tasks, of, of jobs, and so on. Uh, at the, the pre-integration step, you start all those uh, resources, and at the integration step, you just, uh, uh, you let your code use those resources. And then in the post-integration test, they allow you to stop all those external dependencies. If you, if you started them or connected to them at the pre-integration step, then at the post-integration, you disconnect from them or you maybe delete them, kill the containers, or do whatever you want. And then finally, at the step which, is, which goes after post-integration, you check the results of integration tests. So you don't want those resources to continue uh, working even when your integration tests fail. So that's why you give, give an opportunity to start the resources, then you test, maybe some of the, of the tests fail, but you don't want to break the build at this point, you want the build to continue. So the build continues and the build stops the resources, and then the build fails at, this, at the validation step which verifies, validates that um, integration step, uh, integration tests were uh, successful or not. So let's take a look at the, at the entire picture we have here of all the unit tests. So you see how long they are, how slow or how uh, fast they are. Some of them are fast, like 59 milliseconds, 46 milliseconds, they're very, very fast. Some of them are okay, like 300 milliseconds. Some of them are extremely slow, like one second, three seconds, nine seconds. No, nine seconds, is, that's together. Okay, we can ignore that. Actually, why it's nine seconds? Interesting. Okay, uh, five seconds. Five seconds is okay for the entire batch, but let's see individually. So this is very good, look. 11 milliseconds, this is pure unit test. 15 milliseconds, very, very fast. This one is slow. This is not good at all. So, Again, three seconds makes XSL transformations. So why it's slow? Three seconds. Maybe it's just my computer. Let's run it again. Just interesting to see why it's three seconds. And we will now try to change it to a different type of test. Yeah, it's even seven seconds, it's, uh, six seconds. I think it's because the computer is now slowing down because it doesn't seem to be an integration test. Because if you look at the log, everything is like 400 according to the log, 200. Okay, let's take a look at the code. Why it's six seconds. So it does, it takes one XSL document, another XSL document, and it makes a transformation of uh, two XSL documents. It takes one input document and uh, sends it through two XSL documents and gets the result. So it seems to be, it seems to be that it's just a slow unit test because it doesn't use any external resources. It doesn't connect to any, you know, internet resources. It doesn't use even any files. Uh, it, it's all in memory, so it is maybe a good example of uh, of just slow software, but a good example of a unit of a unit. It's still a unit test. Um, I can show you a, a proper integration test in this case in this library. So these are all, in my opinion, all unit tests. Even though 
even those you can see, some of them take, take seconds, one, two seconds, which is slow, which is not really, it's not going to be comfortable for me to develop the software if the test takes six seconds. So imagine this is my unit test, XSL chain test, here it is, and it means that I'm testing XSL chain. So this is my code. So let's say I want to make some changes. I go here and uh, I do, I don't know, some some manipulation. Maybe here, look, it's a collection, so we don't need the collection. Maybe we can do it iterable. So I change collection to iterable. It should work, I guess. I didn't change anything. I made only the improvement. So I go back, and I run this again. I'm building, I'm parsing. No, I, I can't even compile now. Okay. So I'm, I'm far away from the test. I just, I just broke the... Okay, let's make some other change, which is not going to break the syntax. Okay, what can we do here? Maybe the code is good enough. But I don't know. So I made some changes. I go back to the, to the unit test. I run it again. And I need to wait for for six seconds. If it's two, three, six seconds, it's maybe okay. But if it's going to be 20 seconds, then I will be very, you know, my development will be slow. So that's why I try to make tests as fast as possible. Just not to wait for, because they are the helpers. They are the, the, the you know, the tools which support my development, just like an ID. So ID helps me, like you see here, if I change something, uh, if I change the type here, then ID will, uh, will make a hint for me, will compile on the background and say, no, this doesn't work anymore, so that's why it's red, and that's it. The unit test is the same, but a little bit slower. The unit test is not gonna immediately tell me that, but if I click the rerun the test, it immediately, it not immediately, but then it tells me uh, that uh, I made a mistake. How people develop without a test, I cannot understand. Literally. I try always to cover my tests with the, uh, cover my live code with the test, and the amount of test code here, usually in a good product, is larger than the amount of the code here. So if you count the lines of code in this directory, and you count the lines of code in this directory, then in a good stable product, in a mature product, this size should be, some people say three times, but I would say, I mean, two times bigger than the code up here. You need to have more tests than the code. And now let's take a look at integration tests. So in Java, they have a very convenient instrument. Uh, maybe some of you know that it's called Invoker Plugin. So Invoker Plugin allows you inside your Java, inside your Maven project, uh, you can create uh, so-called like small sandbox directories. And inside those directories, you put uh, like mini, mini Maven projects. For example, this library uh, is uh, supposed to work. Like I said, it takes the it takes the XML document and then, uh, you know, wrap it into uh, some object-oriented uh, envelope and uh, provide some additional functionality, which is more convenient than before. And um, in the integration test, I'm trying to verify that it works both uh, with the implementation of uh, DOM coming from Saxon and coming from Xerces. So there are two Java implementations. So I wrote, I created two integration tests in order to validate that uh, my library is going to work in both scenarios. So here in this, in this integration testing setup, it's a full POM XML. In this POM XML, I use my library. Uh, I use my library like here. And then, uh, sorry. And then I uh, use dependencies. For example, this one, Saxon, uh, in, in this configuration. And then, Inside the sources, I have a simple, a simple Java file, which just does, I mean, Java file in simple test uh, to verify that everything works 
some tests to test my library. And I have exactly the same, very similar code here. Again, the sample code, again, the sample error, the sample test, and I have a different POM XML with, uh, again, my dependency here, my own project, and then the Xerces. In instead of Saxon, I have another implementation. And then I run it, uh, and then I run it from command line, and let's see what happens when it runs. We're a bit slow for some reason. Maybe it's good to show you how fast we'll be unit testing and how fast. So like I told you, these are the phases. And first, at first it compiles everything. Then it, uh, I'm just showing you the important one. Then the test compile, it compiles the tests. And then this plugin called Surefire, so Surefire just runs all tests, one after another. You can see the time for them. They're very slow because now you see this is load average. So I have 20 on the computer. Load average is very high. So that's why it takes, it takes so long to run the test. But usually, if everything is cool, then, then the, they're supposed to be fast. So look, it took, I don't know how much time. Test runs. Yeah, in total, maybe it should take a few seconds. Maybe, maybe a few dozen of seconds. And then it goes into uh, Invoker plugin. So Invoker, Invoker plugin, it makes the... First, it, uh, it installs everything into special folder. So it makes uh, a special folder inside target. It's called local repo. So it puts my, it puts my, own, uh, my own plugin, my, my own artifact, which I'm developing, it put into this temporary folder inside the target here, put my jar in there. And then it runs this, these guys who I showed you before. The first one success, the second one success. And you see the timing here. So it's about 30 seconds. Well, if the, the computer would be not so slow right now, it would take maybe 10 seconds or so. But still, there's one test, one single test, which takes a big amount of time. And this is integration test. So it, it puts everything together and guarantees me that I didn't break anything. So if I see failure here, if I see the, 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 if it says failure, I'm not gonna end, let's put it this way. If I see failure here and I don't see failure here, then it's a problem. Then I need to, then I need to work more on my unit tests. So this shouldn't happen like this. So if, I, if there is no errors here in the unit tests, but there is an error here, it means that my integration tests are stronger than my unit tests. So the first step, if I see the situation, I go back to my unit tests and I try to reproduce the same problem in the unit test. When an integration test failure fails, I go back to unit test and reproduce the bug there and make sure the unit test also fails. In general, you know the fixing bugs, it should be the cycle. I, I hope it's, it's clear, it's obvious to every one of you, but still, we need to say that that uh, uh, every time you see a bug in the code, I mean, in the bug coming from the user, not in the code. So let's say you run the product and you see an indicator of an error. Somebody is telling you a bug or reporting you a bug or you see a bug yourself. You don't jump into fixing the bug. First step you do is you reproduce the bug with a unit test. If the bug is there, and your unit tests don't say anything, all of your unit tests don't say anything, but the bug is there, it means that the failure is not in the code, the failure is in the unit tests. First step you do, you reproduce the same, you create a test which will fail as well. You need to have an automated failure. When you have it, then you start fixing. Most people don't do that. I see many pull requests every day coming to me from different people. Very often, people just submit the bug fix without the test covering that bug fix. So they just say, I found the bug. Here's the fix. Take it. But the question is, how do we guarantee that the same bug will not show tomorrow? How did you test it? How did you, how did you catch it? 
And usually it's just my intuition. I just feel that the bug is there, so I just fix it. I run it locally. I, I did everything locally. It doesn't fail for me anymore, so take it. So you don't do this. First of all, you reproduce the bug in the test, and then when you reproduce, then you, uh, then you commit the, the fix. And usually, if the project is mature enough, then usually the time which you spend on writing a test to reproduce the bug is a much bigger than the time you spend to actually fix the bug. This is how it should be. When the project is young, when you're just starting to develop something, then of course you spend more time on writing the functionality, on implementing the functionality, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of testing, instead of writing unit tests. But when the product is more or less stable, then you have to, uh, you have to grow, the amount of tests have to grow, and the amount of code will be more or less uh, the same or will grow, but much slower. 